Hey, Walter Crosby with Helix Sales Development, your host for Sales and Cigars. Today's episode isn't a lot about sales. It's about Japanese whiskey, Japanese spirits. And I've got Christopher Pellegrini on, on the episode today. He's in Tokyo, first time talking to somebody in Japan. Um, it was uh, enlightening. He tells us a great story about how this particular uh, whiskey is created and why it's so different, how it almost became how everybody, uh, how all whiskeys were created over here. It's a really compelling story. Um, it, it, it was just a lot of fun to learn and have a conversation about um, this particular brand of, of, of Japanese whiskey and the uniqueness of it and how the, the process is wildly different than than anything else that's produced in this country um, and, and how the flavor palettes uh, uh, match up. So it, if you really want to learn a little bit about a particular spirit and a, and a, a, a really interesting gentleman, great story, um, go grab a cocktail, grab a cigar, strap in for another great episode of Sales and Cigars. So Christopher, I really appreciate you taking uh, uh, some time um, and, and is you're in Japan, so forgive me. Are, is it really early or really late for you there? I guess it's I guess it's late. Uh, it's ten o'clock at night. Um, but honestly, it's still okay. sort of the beginning of my work day because uh, the the rest of my team is on the eastern seaboard of the United States, so I'll be up until four. Wow! So your uh, your bio rhythms and your bio your clock. Uh, is a little off kilter compared to everybody. I'm actually else 22 here. years old. <laughs> All right, so let's let's dive let's dive in. Um, that's that's funny. Um, so c- c- let's let's talk. First, let's get the pronunciation right of your okay. company. We're going to talk a little bit about today about Japanese whiskey and how it relates to bourbon. So um, just like go let's let's just start talking i might ask some questions but let's let's go i would imagine you're pretty versed in japanese whiskeys well i i uh japanese spirits i think is where i would call myself at home okay uh yeah honkaku spirits h-o-n-k-a-k-u honkaku which means authentic in japanese is a company that uh i started in march of 2020 with a couple of other inspired souls and that was amazing timing. Quit my full-time job in March of 2020, right at the at the front of the pandemic, and started this import company based in New York, in on Long Island. And it's been a journey. It's been a um, I often say character building experience. But the mission of the company is to bring <laughs> Japanese spirits, indigenous spirits, to a wider audience. And for those of you counting at home, that's going to be namely shochu, S-H-O-C-H-U, shochu, and its predecessor from Okinawa, awamori, A-W-A-M-O-R-I, awamori. And, but I, I think the, the brand that we have in the U.S., that, and it's the one that certainly gets the most press, that people get the most excited about, is a whiskey uh, by the name of Takamine, Takamine, T-A-K-A-M-I. Yeah, that's right. T-A-K-A-M-I-N-E. You'll notice that the vowel sounds in Japanese are pr- pronounced almost like they're Spanish or Italian. So if you've ever studied one of those Romance languages, just do the same thing with the vowels and you'll be 99% of the way there with your pronunciation, right? So um, All right, that's takamine, helpful. koji whiskey. All right, and I'm going to come back to that word koji because it's really important. But uh, this whiskey okay. is... You know, it's it's interesting because a lot of people who try it, they um, they will often say, oh, wow, this reminds me a little bit of a bourbon, um, which is absolutely inaccurate in terms of the the mash bill, the production process and, and pretty much everything else. It's made in Japan. Um, it's not made in in, um, you know, it's not it's not made with Kentucky. corn. It's not uh, it's 100 percent barley. And it's a little bit lower ABV than a lot of the stuff that you probably drink at home if you're a bourbon fan. It's 40.3% ABV. 
um, which is a little bit yeah, well, well. kind of middling, but it has mm -hmm. probably one of the best stories behind it. And it's probably one of the easiest hand cells that I've ever experienced in my life. Hand cell meaning, meaning you're in a liquor store, you're, you're, you know, you're milling around and you're browsing and then you're like, you know, I like this and I like that. The, the staff at liquor stores love this brand because they get started on the story and people are like, are you serious? That's, that's for real. So, um, Takamine, Takamine Koji whiskey. It's, it says eight years on the label. Um, little secret. It's actually older than that because thanks to Corona, nothing got done on time. So we got the labels approved at eight years. It spent another year in cask. So, uh, it's nine, but whatever bonus year wow. and, uh, bonus. And it's, uh, it's inspired by the first Japanese person to ever make whiskey in the history of never ever, but he wasn't doing it in Japan. He was doing this in Peoria, Illinois in the 1890s. <laughs> and okay. All right. So, so this, this, this spirit is, it, 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 it's modeled or it's, it's inspired by a Japanese fellow in Southern Illinois using barley using the same i'm same gonna grain? don't don't tell him this but uh, it, he passed a long time ago but we, we use much better ingredients than he was using back 100 and, mm -hmm. 130 years ago uh we use only sure. uh, two row milled bar polished barley so different for the for the okay. home brewers out there and the people who understand whiskey production we're not talking about malted barley here we're talking about about polished barley so it's it's had most of the hull sanded off of it and and this is yep. this is inspired by him and his attempt to basically turn the entire whiskey industry on its head which he was he was that close to doing back in the 1890s so i'll give you the abridged version dr joe kichi takamine went to the states he fell in love with a, a young woman named caroline hitch when he visited new orleans they end up getting married they have a couple of they have start a family um Joe Kichi Jr., who I believe went by the nickname Joe, and and his his spare was uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Takamine, who I think who went by the name Eben, and he got into okay. bed with the Illinois Whiskey Trust back at back before the turn of the century. The Illinois Whiskey Trust, of course, owned everything. They were a monopoly to end all monopolies yeah. back in the day. They controlled 80% of whiskey production in the United States in the late 1800s. And they were very okay. intrigued by Dr. Takamine's patent. Dr. Takamine won the first biologic patent in U.S. history for a Japanese mold, a filamentous mold used to make whiskey. He basically patented the process. Now, this mold is used to make everything in Japan. You've probably heard of miso soup. I know you've heard of soy sauce. You've yeah. heard of sake. You've heard of, I said sure. shochu, awamori before. These are all made with this mold, which is the magic of Japanese fermentation. And all he did was find a way to apply it to whiskey production. And voila, we have a very interested large corporation who sees dollar signs on the horizon. They're about to save a boatload of sure. money on production. They don't need mash tons when you use koji. They don't need lauder tons. All of that huge, expensive, cumbersome, um, you know, space-taking technology is no longer necessary. There's no hot side to the process anymore when using koji. And this was going to be huge. The, the, the trust was going to save, they, they calculated about 15% on production costs. And if successful, this was going to roll out to all of their distilleries all across the country. It was going to basically, it was going to rip malted grains out of the equation and insert cogified grains. This is this was nuts. And a couple of weeks, he was he was no, successful that's, too. That's a that's a huge um, that's a huge shift. And the, the the mold it it can I would imagine they could produce that, grow that, uh, and control it. And that would be a whole lot 
I mean, they're, all of their their costs overall would probably oh, keep yeah. going down. Yeah. Um, to to a degree. All right. So I interrupted. No, no, I'm not sorry. at all. I mean, that you, you're absolutely right. This was going to be, this was a game changer. And he was successful. He figured out he had a lab at the Manhattan distillery in Peoria. It was the largest, I believe it was the largest distillery or at least whiskey distillery in the United States at the end of the 1800s. And he had a laboratory there. He was set up doing these experiments. He was successful a couple of weeks before they were going to start distilling. They got written up in the Tribune and it was nothing too sensational, but it was, it was definitely along the lines of cheaper whiskey is here. It's, you know, bigger, better, faster, all that sort of stuff. Well, as you can imagine, there was a very large business interest that was not excited to hear about a maltless whiskey. And that's the malt. Sure. Source. So one night in the middle of the night, they, <laughs> excuse me, one night in the middle of the night, they broke into the distillery and they tried to kill him. Um, they were unsuccessful. They Killed tried to him? kill him. They tried to assassinate him. Cause he was, Holy he was crap. the one who was going to put them out of business. He was, a, this is a, this is a foreign guy. This is an import guy in the 1890s who was going to put the good old boys out of business. Yeah. Right. So they went after him. Yeah. People were not, not very enlightened in the, in those days, uh, especially in that part I'm, of the world. I'm sure that's accurate. Wow. And they couldn't find him though. He was, he knew the distillery at night better than they did. Um, I don't think they had like motion lights and everything when you were walking around in the 1890s. So he escaped into the basement and basically vanished. So they had to settle for um, incinerating Destroying. his lab, which they did to an incredibly competent wow. degree and set him back by several years. But he got back up and running and he was, again, they were making whiskey. They were making koji whiskey, not malt whiskey. They were making koji whiskey and they were barreling it. And this was uh 1894 and they were going to make it happen it was going to hit the market but then this was teddy roosevelt's heyday um and with his his special right. brand of populism and and there was a, and this is I'm, i don't don't get me wrong i agree with him it was an anti there was an antitrust movement there was an anti-monopoly movement and the sherman antitrust act was used in illinois to chop up the trust to break to bust the trust and Takamine's right. patent was one of the assets that got sold off at auction and Manhattan distillery was shuttered and all of that Koji whiskey, which was the first whiskey ever made by a Japanese person, as far as we can tell, was lost to history, unfortunately. So, but our, so our, our whiskey is inspired by his, his endeavors and blessed by his family. His family has a trust in Japan. And we asked them, they never allow a commercial product to have his name on it if he didn't have anything to do with it necessarily. But, you know, I was right. really disappointed that my friend's children here in, in Japan don't really learn about him. Uh, they, there's so much more to his story. So the, Takamine, of course, he, he tried, he sued, he tried to get his patent back. It didn't happen. He got really sick. He abandoned the case. Um, but he never stopped innovating. He never stopped being the really humble creator that he was. And he used his knowledge of koji, which is this mold from Japan, which excretes enzymes, amylase and protease enzymes, which are essential for breaking proteins into amino acids and breaking starch chains into glucose, essentially simple soluble sugars. And he took that mm -hmm. and he created an early, I don't know what we want to call it, like an early Tums, or an early, it's an early antacid. And he, because okay. the, the en enzymatic activity with the Koji can help kind of settle down what's going on in your stomach. So I actually have a vial of this from, from, uh, many, many years ago. It was called Taka from Taka, mm. Takamine diastase. And this was extremely successful. He licensed it to Park Davis, huge pharmaceutical concern and made a, made a fortune and moved his family to uh, New York City where he had a beautiful walk up. I think it was five stories. And of course he's a chemist. So he has a lab in his home. I guess that's what you did back at the turn of the century. And in his free time, in his home laboratory, he isolated medical adrenaline, which is the first time that a human hormone has 
ever been isolated in the in the history of humanity. So if you know anybody who's ever used an EpiPen, you have you yeah. have this guy, Dr. Takamine, to thank. So millions of lives saved over the last hundred years. He actually died. He passed away on July twenty second, twenty twenty two, almost exactly a century ago. Uh, to not twenty nineteen twenty two. So yeah, this past month yeah. was like two two weeks ago. About was the centennial of his death. He's buried at Woodlawn in the Bronx. He has a gigantic mausoleum. Um, and he was just, he was a phenomenal human is basically, that's, there's no other way to put it. You know, all of the. He was like, a, he was like a Thomas Edison, um, but in, from a chemistry point of view, tinkering and, 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 and just working on ideas that, that, that he, that he had to improve lives yeah. or, uh, and I, I doubt that he was driven by it dollars as much green. as he was driven by. Yeah, it was about just finding something, doing something different, being uh, creating something that uh, was new and, and could ad advantage the community. finding answers. I want to go back to something. Yeah, finding answers. I, I go back to something that you said a, a, a couple minutes ago about that your friends, children in Japan, you're disappointed that they don't really learn about him. Um, is that because he never went back to Japan that he stayed here? Is it, is there, cause that, I mean, he is, I, I'm, I'm equating him to a, a Thomas Edison, somebody that, that, that was always constantly tinkering and made money, of yeah, course. Yeah. But, that's a great, great story. I think, I, think, um, I think that's, I think you're headed right in the right direction with that, that line of inquiry. He did all of his best work in the States. That's for absolute sure. Now it's interestingly enough, he did, he did start a company over here after he married Caroline Hitch. They did move back to Japan for a little while. Um, it was a bit of a rough transition for Caroline and they ended up heading back to the States after a few years. But he started what is now one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in Japan called Daiichi Sankyo. So he, he, he does certainly have roots and he has been consequential over here. But my friend's children, they do, they do know the name sometimes. You hear Takamine, some people be like, is that a guitar company? And I'm like, you know, it is. Um, but that's not the Takamine we're talking about. Um, it's like, Stop oh, is he, the, is, he the, is he the cherry tree guy? I'm like, yes, he's the cherry tree guy. Okay, so this is great. You're going to love this. So he, cherry tree? he okay. donated, he facilitated, paid for the cherry trees in the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. And the cherry trees in Patterson Park in Baltimore. And the cherry trees at, at Grant's Tomb up in New York. I mean, he just, he was so into, later in life, he was so into Japanese-American relations and he wanted to do anything he could. He, he saw war was on the horizon. Um, he he, could, he yeah. could kind of feel it coming. So he operated kind of as like a de facto informal ambassador for Japan. And he, so, and he was incredibly generous. He was incredibly humble. He didn't want credit for donating the cherry trees. So he worked through an official organization to keep his name off of it. But if you go to DC, you can find, a, you can find recognition of him on a plaque saying thanks to the, the graciousness of Dr. Takamine, we still get to enjoy these cherry trees today. So my friend's children hear about that, um, which has a, mm. obviously a very, very direct tie to spring culture all across this archipelago. And uh, that for, for kids, they get really excited about that. They're like, oh, that's, those, are, those trees are from Japan? Yeah, they were. They were thousands of them. They were shipped in on a boat from Japan. No, no mean feat oh, there, that sir. I did not know. Ooh. No, that's that's huge, and those are beautiful. The those those parks, the 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 mall in D.C., the parks in Baltimore, and and Grant's tomb. That that's just in the springtime. Those are just beautiful sights, and the smells. Yeah. Um, we have. Uh, I live in Michigan, and we have um, in the northern part of the mitten. There's a, a huge cherry, um, a huge cherry festival, and and everything cherries is going on mm -hmm. but it, that happens in the springtime if you're up that way it's 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 the same thing it's just the the the, the aromas in the air and the the, the beautiful flowers are, it's such, are a, everywhere. such a magical so, time yeah it's absolutely it, yeah it really is one of the best times of the year plus the fruit plus the fruit's not too bad when it uh, when it ripens sure. up too yeah so that's awesome 
I didn't I didn't realize those came from uh, Isn't Japan. That, isn't that nuts? So it, it's a um, I mean that is a it's a great story. So when it, you go back to what you said about a hand yeah. cell, you know, in a liquor store, um, I mentioned to this before we jumped on the recording that I've been reticent to try Japanese whiskey sure. or Japanese spirits because I, you know, I kind of go down this rabbit hole and I was spending a, a tremendous amount of money when I would just go and like, I want to try something new. And, and my guy, Mike would be like, all right, I saved you this thing. Nice. Right. And then he would bring out this bottle and I, I had to, you know, I had to buy it. And he kept just testing. Right. You know, we went from like $30 bottles to $230 bottles. And I, just, I ran out of room and my wife started wondering, what the hell are you doing yep. with all of this? No, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a good way to be out in the doghouse. If, if the boxes start stacking up, you, you run into trouble. Believe me, I understand. This well, is a I, I real have, background. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I have a, a, a my own little cigar room with my own bar. So it's, it's separate, but it, there's still... You know, I don't I don't drink a lot by myself and um, there's, you know, quite a few bottles here. So but you you've inspired me to to go try this this because under understanding how something's made and understanding the backstory. Yeah. Right. That, you know, as you refer to it as a hand cell, I mean, that that's incredibly powerful because once you understand, you know, you might not. You might not be able to tell the story the way as eloquently as you did, but you, you, what you want to do is pour that for a friend mm -hmm. and share the story to the best of your ability, yeah. and and you know in, include them and and things just start to exactly. to spread. Exactly. Um, so thank you. Now you, I'm going to go down this rabbit okay. hole with uh, uh Well, I'll give you. I so if, oh, go ahead. About, well, what I wanted to do is talk about how listeners go best way to go about finding a retailer okay. that that would, would have this um but i mean i love your story so if you want to finish up or uh, uh, expand on the story go, let's go there first well, i guess I'll, I'll just give you the the elevator pitch on why this is a good option um again it's a it's a koji whiskey so there's no malted grains involved it's all kojified barley and it's aged for at least eight years um in a combination of virgin oak from the ozarks the, the staves are shipped to Japan and coopered in Miyazaki Prefecture, and then ex-bourbon as well. What happens is um, a lot of, sometimes, you know, you'll be in a, a sales situation and, and folks are like, I, I don't really dig Japanese whiskey. And because it is, it pays, it really is um, and paying homage, or I don't know how you say that word, homage, I've heard it both ways, to the Scotch tradition. And, and so a lot of people don't really like that style. And what I can say to that is, hey, no, this is, there's no peatiness to this at all. It is 100% made in Japan, brewed, distilled, aged, bottled in Fukuoka, Japan. But the grains are, are not peated. There's no smokiness to it. And, and then I say, I often will say to people, you know, it's because of that, because of the oak, there is a bourbon-like quality to it. You're going to recognize a, a light sweetness to it that is really comforting to a lot of folks that are coming from a bourbon background or, or a, yeah. a, a bur bourbon fandom. So it's, it's honestly, so why, it's neither. Why, yeah, it's, 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 you're right. It's neither, but because of the, the, of the, of the grains and then because of the, uh, the, the, the wood, but why, the, why do people assume that it is more like a scotch that has that peatiness? Cause there's no. There's no peat in yeah, it. Yeah, you're. It's just that a lot of Japanese, the the original. It's interesting. The 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 guy uh, Maka, Masataka Taketsuru, who has helped establish the two largest whiskey houses in Japan, Suntory and Nika, um, he really was trying to replicate Scotch when he started out, and the entire industry for oh. a, for a century has largely been following in his footsteps to one degree of success or another. So there's a lot of folks out there who equate Japanese whiskey with single malt scotch. And, uh, you know, there is, there is that affinity. But this is somewhere closer to what Dr. Takamine was attempting to do in the States. Now, it's not a bourbon in any way, shape, or form. It has no 
corn in it. It's, no it's just, it's a bridge between those two styles. It really is. It's just like. Is it like, uh, maybe this is a terrible metaphor, but wine, um, you know, some people will drink a, a Pinot Grigio or a, or a Sauvignon Blanc, and then they, they will enjoy those, like, especially on a warm summer evening, but they don't want any part of Chardonnay. Sure. Um, because of, you know, the oakiness, yeah. um, and that, that, that heavy, even though if you can get a buttery Chardonnay, they still, they, they still, uh, you know, shy away from them. Um, but it, it sounds to me like it's, it's about marketing that, you know, because somebody was trying to create something similar to scotch whiskey, there, there's a, there's this marketing story that's gone along with it. Um, cause I had that that kind of sense in the back of my head that there was a connection there somehow. And I'm, you know, I'll, I'll enjoy a scotch every once in a while, but I got to be in the mood mm -hmm. and it's just a little, a little bit. Um, but I do like a big PD scotch when I do gotcha. it. Um, so I, I think it's a, it, it's more about marketing and misinformation, if you will. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's really going on, especially with um, it, it so your spirit is going to be a like a, a a refreshing little in between those a bourbon a scotch um a Kentucky a, a Tennessee whiskey it, it's going to have its own little flavor for completely different reasons mm -hmm. right and it's it's going to have some qualities of that that bourbon yep and then it's going to have some of its own unique op openness and is it is it real um I mean, i'm excited to go try this now um is it, it, it on the tongue does it is it viscous is it thinner than, than it's, got a, it's got a good body that? to it it's got a very nice mouthfeel to it my favorite aspect of it is the finish which has a a little bit of a creme brulee thing going on so it's got and it's Ooh. and it's it's not a it's not the longest whiskey you've ever had in your life but it is it's got a nice broad tail to it and uh yeah it's it's i i i think the 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 best way to categorize it is by itself as you alluded it is essentially a new style it's it's attempting to close the cir circle on this failed experiment if he had been successful but we'd all be drinking new. cold you whiskey right now yeah, but it's not new. It's it's a you're right. It's something that it was attempted. That's been around for over a hundred years, but then got a bunch of rednecks Trying blew it up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is a terrible aspect of the story. But um, should be a Hollywood film. But it is an aspect. It is an. You're right. It could be a. a it, it could be a terrifying story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We see that it is, it, Netflix. Um, if you're listening, <laughs> there you go. So talk about how you're 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 distributing this and 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 selling this to people. I get the hand sell idea. Yeah. That that's just a compelling story, but you can't do that with everybody. So Correct. yeah. You know, how does that talk about that for me? Cuz this is this is interesting. We are in we we pick very carefully our our retail partners. So a lot of smaller places that are that are really particular about their drinks. If they have a they have a really serious mezcal program, for instance, and we want to talk to them. Um, we're distributed mainly by a company called Winebow, which has us in close to about 20 states. And then um, from there, we've also added on state by state other distributors. I think we're close to 30 states total now. Um, and are you in Kentucky? Uh, we are in. The, we are basically yes. Basically yes, we are. We, we are just in the process of finishing the negotiations to be distributed there. Um, so okay. that the easiest way to find it, if you um, have your smartphone handy, is to just go to www.honkakuspirits.com. Honkaku is H-O-N-K-A-K-U, Honkaku. And then find the Takamine Koji Whiskey page, and there's a little find a retailer. I believe it's a yellow button. And that'll use either a zip code that you insert or your, you know, your IP address or whatever you allow it to do to find right. the, both the off-premise and on-premise locations near where you intend to be. Okay. That's, 
it's easy enough and we'll have we'll have the website for the people freaking out trying to uh trying to remember what how you just spelt that um thank you we'll have that in the show notes so everybody can can go find it and be, be able to to go try this um truly japanese spirit with some i mean i i think it's got american roots right it, it almost um, was an american tradition almost yep so it's 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 a it, it's got to be one of those it, it's 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 a story like you said for net netflix uh, netflix or amazon would could pick that up and really tell you could do it as a a drama but you could also do it as a documentary that would be just as compelling oh yeah um like a docudrama uh -huh. um that's that's uh, it's an absolutely amazing. fascinating story that touches several parts and, of the united and, states and you and the way the way you shared it uh it was you know i was i was leaning in to um to, to like what's the next piece of this what's the next piece of this i really was um really in, in, enjoying the story and that's gonna to me that is an important part of that it's a compelling part of like kentucky bourbons when you look into the backstory of some of those distilleries that have have been around for hundreds of years and and where they really came from and what kind of guy uh um the kind of guy Jack Daniels really was, or Jim Beam, and right. and and all the other, you know, major distilleries. Um, th to me, that's that's uh, learning that is 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 almost as fun as sampling the the <clears throat> the spirit. So um, this is awesome. So I'm I'm looking at um, you have a distributor or you have a, a, a retailer about two miles from my house. Oh yeah. Um, I have to head over that way today to pick up something. So I am going to go pick up a bottle of, uh, of your. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Tell me, I can't wait this to hear what awesome. you think. Yeah, I will. I will share that with, uh, with the audience and I'll share that with you. Um, is there anything that, uh, that we can do to help, um, help your, your distribution model? Cause you're based out of, is it New York or Long Island? That, yep. our, okay. Yeah, our, we're headquartered in, in New York, but uh, we are attempting to bring this story to the entire United States. Um, we probably won't go to Europe because I don't think that we can make enough, honestly. Uh, it's not my distillery. I'm, you know, it's, it's a partnership. But uh, the sure. distillery, just there's only so much space, obviously. There's only, only so many barrels you can, you can cram into the rickhouse. Oh. So. How many barrels are you producing annually that, that get aged? The, I don't know the exact number of barrels, but I do know that we've, we, this year in 2022, I believe we were able to bottle close to, close to 10,000 bottles this year, which is an improvement over last year. But I, I think we're going to hit our ceiling pretty quickly. Uh, honestly, I just, okay. I mean, obviously eight years is eight years. And, uh, yeah. so this has been a long time coming and I don't, I don't think I, I just, I just, we had no way of knowing how much was, how popular this was going to be and how, how well it was going to resonate and it's resonated really well. So we're in, immensely grateful for that. And, um, to anybody out there who finds themselves in the same room with Takamine, Kanpai. Kanpai. Um, the, I, I'm, I got, I'm curious as to what the, what the climate is like where you where you age the the barrels compared to the climate in like Kentucky because it gets super freaking hot yeah. and it gets chilly so in the winter you get all of those yeah there, there's there's quite a bit of uh fluctuation in Fukuoka as well the the summers and winters are very different the nights and days can be quite different and they age takamine in a retired grain bunker um it, it was a wartime facility that had massive walls to protect grain stores and so inside mm. there's not the same level of fluctuation they can keep it somewhat tame in terms of the the highs and the lows of the temperature they've got a great barrel program and and great management of that facility um they do a lot of a lot of movement of the barrels and so it's a uh, just seeing the building itself is kind of like what is this um but they 
it's it's just this gigantic concrete um structure bunker. it's a bunker essentially that that was We're, that really. survived the war and uh and now they age takamine in it <laughs> awesome all right um so i'd like to uh we always we always end the uh, um the the podcast with you know asking a guest about their relationship with cigars but i'm kind of I'm kind of curious as to um, two questions, right? What, how, how do you think Takamine uh, pairs up with a, with a cigar? Um, if you have any insight into that and then what's the, what's the cigar culture in, in Tokyo, you got 20 million people there, I think yeah. um, close quarters. Um, you have a different, a different way of thinking about things um, there than than here in the states. I mean, what? How are cigars received in Tokyo, and and how does it that's fit? A, with that's your a spirit? great great question. It is definitely something that people do geek out on, and there are less less restrictions on the importation of cigars from certain uh, unnamed countries. So it's it's very possible to go into uh, a small little tobacconist and find like, oh, geez. You have that. Wow. Um, I remember I, I, I'm not all that well versed in cigar culture, to be perfectly honest with you. But I did work on a film that that where it's a short film where smoking cigars was a central part of the relationship between the two main characters. And so I do have a little bit of exposure to it. And obviously dealing dealing in spirits. I mean, it's something that I do obviously have to pay attention to the culture of of cigar bars in Tokyo is nothing to be sniffed at. Although I will say there's a lot more shisha that's moving in sometimes the, that, I don't know what that is. It's like a, it's a tobacco water bong. I, it's. Oh, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we have those. It's, it's a middle Eastern, um, a culture, uh, with the, with the tobaccos wet, and right. it's in a little pod, and then they 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 smoke, smoke it. Together, sometimes right? they flavor the water. Uh, hookahs is what, yeah, hookahs, is what they're exactly. Right. Yeah, so there's um, a lot of places claiming to be cigar bars will magically be hookah bars, and and so that uh, throws you for a little bit of a loop sometimes, unless you're into that, and, and many people are. Uh, but it is something that if you happen to like your cigars and you and you want to be able to enjoy them alongside a nice tipple, Tokyo's a pretty good place to land. Cool. All right. Um, I really appreciate you. What What was the name of the the short film that you were involved in that had two characters? It was were... actually. It, I I don't know. I it might be on, a Japanese am, film. Uh, based in Japan, but it's an English short film called Little Tokyo. Little Tokyo. Little okay. Tokyo. Yep. And uh, I have no idea if, when, where it's available. Uh, it was probably a dozen well, years ago. Something, give me something to do. Um, Might be on IMDb, uh, who knows? Yeah, to go look for it. So, um, you know, Christopher, I really appreciate the education um, and the fact that now you're going to have me go down another rabbit hole, um, go trying some things out. Terribly um, sorry. Which is, yeah, <laughs> but it's a great story, great uh, great presentation of this story. I mean, it's, it's obviously some passion there. So, you know, the listeners uh, out there, go grab the uh, – the website and we'll go check it out from the show notes. And it's really easy to go find where you can find these spirits. Um, in, and we only touched on one. Yeah. So this whole, this whole concept is, is on the website. So, um, um, maybe we have you back sometime to talk about some of the other, uh, oh, some of the other spirits. That would be uh, great. I would fall all over myself to be able to do that. Thank you. Sweet potato and rice, uh, show uh, to, yeah. That's that seems a little uh, interesting. So, um, and, and not pairing ready. some of these up, we, maybe not, maybe not, because we have some very stubborn little palates that uh, that are used to certain things. And um, I, I don't know. I like experimenting. So, we'll uh, I'll go try some of these, and we'll get you back on the show to go talk about uh, some of the other ones. That would be All great. Right? Thank you so much for your time, Walter. I really appreciate it. Thank you.